yeah heavenly father we thank you for giving us yet another opportunity to gather here today to be present to hear your word again lord and fellowship with our dear holy spirit and also with one another we thank you for your many precious promises which are a yes and a yes lord and an amen in our lord and savior jesus christ and let us hold fast to that which is good and we seek to do everything to the glory of god so that our soul spirit and body be present in complete submission for the coming of our lord jesus christ and lord we thank you for the for the blessings on brother vincent with all your spiritual blessings lord thank you you are revealing who is revealing to us all the truths lord and we are hearing your word more and more we are able to get enriched and empowered by your assurance lord jesus as we lift this prayer to you lord i ask for a continued awareness of your your presence and your power so by the help of the holy spirit we will start by listening attentively to every word understand and um, program ourselves accordingly to what your what you god think thank you lord thank you lord for this and much much more in the mighty name of jesus amen lord thank you thank you amen 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 thank you sister joyce for the very beautiful spirit filled opening prayer and my brothers and sisters a warm welcome to each one of you as i mentioned to you at the introduction we have in today's gospel from matthew chapter 9 verses 14 to 15 something to learn about what the issue or what the topic is really about it's all about fasting and you know my sister and brothers at the beginning of this introduction or because of this reflection let us remember one thing we are children of the new covenant we are not children of the old covenant so when we read these scriptures we must remember that what time we need to put these scriptures into practice when were these scriptures uttered by jesus and how they make you know sense to us today how we can relate to these verses today not just take it and start applying as it is because when we understand in which covenant we belong then it becomes easier for us to apply the word of god Amen. So today's topic is about believers fasting to refocus on the word of God. That's how I have entitled this topic today. Believers fast today in the new covenant to refocus themselves on the word of God. So let's go to today's gospel passage. It is from Matthew chapter nine, and we've got only two verses. Verse fourteen and verse fifteen. So let's read these two verses, and then let's see what the Spirit of God wants to teach each one of us today. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, "Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but thy disciples fast not?" And Jesus said unto them. can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them and then shall they fast praise god thank you jesus so you know my sister and brother we've got just two verses to reflect on today in verse number 14 we hear about the disciples of john the baptist so this disciple of john is john the baptist and his disciples have come to jesus and what do they ask jesus they say look here jesus you know we fast the pharisees are fasting but your disciples are feasting is this all right is this okay there's something really wrong here we are fasting the pharisees are fasting the religious leaders are fasting and your disciples and you 
you don't seem to fast at all whenever we are fasting or whenever we are prescribed to fast you are only eating you you don't have any time for whatsoever to fast what's going on and you know my sister and brothers it's very interesting that jesus is disciples didn't fast very interesting you know you know I, you know what we are going to learn today from these verses you know some of you are definitely going to have a broad smile on your face because you know what sometimes the lord has his own sense of humor you know he has his own sense of humor sometimes when we come to the god to the word of god we come to bible class we go to church we are so mournful people we act as though you know we need to be so different we need to be so serious there is no joy on our faces even the songs that we sing we sing so mournfully we don't have any joyful songs about us and you know sister and brothers here is a question that is asked by john the baptist's disciples to jesus saying that look here jesus we are all fasting the pharisees are fasting but your disciples we don't see them fasting even you know we 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 never seen them ever you know close their mouth they are always munching some monkey nuts or they are always munching something how come this is true and you know my sister and brothers it's very interesting especially interesting when you recognize that at least two of the disciples of jesus now were actually the disciples of john the baptist at one time now i will show you at least one disciple who one one apostle who was a disciple of john the baptist let us go to john chapter 1 john chapter 1 verses 35 onwards let's see verse number 35 to about i think 39 or 40 we will see that one of the disciples of of, of jesus now was with him was also a disciple of john the baptist look at that again again the next day after john stood and two of his disciples and looking upon jesus as he walked he said behold the lamb of god and the two disciples heard him speak and they followed jesus then jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them what seek you they said unto him rabbi which is to say being interpreted master where dwell do well where dwell you now you know my sister and brothers these disciples were the disciples of john the baptist and when they were going with their master john the baptist they see jesus and john the baptist turns around to his disciples and looking at jesus says this is the lamb of god and then the disciples turn around and they say you know what are, what are you looking for me are you looking for me jesus is telling them and he says come and see when you look at verse number 39 he says come and see and then when you look at verse number 40 it says one of the two which heard john speak and followed him was andrew Simon Peter's brother so you know my sister and brothers andrew had now become a disciple of jesus andrew was a disciple of jesus and this same andrew belonged to the, was a, was a disciple of john the baptist and since he was a disciple of john the baptist surely he was fasting but now that he had become a disciple of jesus he was simply feasting you know my sister and brothers think about it this way you know there are so many people you know they they change their company suppose they are working in a particular company or they are working in a particular place they like to change that company they like to go to another company why because that company will offer them better salary it will offer them you know better perks it will give them better work timings it will offer them more benefits so they always want to jump and go here was andrew at least one of the disciples who belonged to the party of, of john the baptist and he must have realized being in the party of john the baptist john the baptist is on this fasting there is so much of lord do this do that and all of a sudden he is attracted to jesus and he realizes that jesus is not going to tell him to fast jesus is not going to tell him to do all those laws and regulation it's going to be a lot of freedom working for jesus and he leaves the party of john the baptist and he becomes a disciple of jesus and they were brothers sisters the reason i'm mentioning this to you is at least andrew was accustomed to fasting until he came and became a disciple of jesus and he stopped fasting 
Now, I want you to look at this question. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 9, verse number 14. And I want you all to carefully look at this question in verse number 14. Can we read that again, please? Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples fast not? Now, you know, my brothers and sisters, look at this question. The question is, why are your disciples not fasting? We are fasting. The Pharisees are fasting. You know, the disciples of John the Baptist are telling him that, you know, listen, we are, we are a different breed altogether. They are actually comparing themselves to Jesus' disciples. You know, my brothers and sisters, why do we fast? But why do your disciples don't fast? That's exactly the question that John the Baptist's disciples are asking Jesus. You know, my sister and brother, listen to this very carefully. You know, let's come to 2022. Let's come to 2022. We are right now on the second day of Lent. Two days ago, we started the season of Lent. It was Ash Wednesday. Today, we are on a Friday. And you know, my brothers and sisters, now that we belong to the, you know, we are coming to the season of Lent, now that we belong to the new covenant, Many people don't know what is the meaning of fasting. Somebody tells them to fast. Somebody announces in the church to fast. They will simply fast. But you know, you know what this question that those disciples of John the Baptist asked Jesus is exactly like people today in the body of Christ asking someone, why are you not fasting in Lent? Why are you not fasting on these specified days like, you know, on Ash Wednesday or any Wednesday or on a Friday? Why are you eating meat on these days? Why are you eating meat on Friday? Why are you eating meat on, on, on Wednesday? Why are you eating meat? Or even if you're eating meat, why can't you at least take one day of the day of Friday and stop eating meat? You know, my brothers and sisters, the question is, why are you not following what we are doing? You know, there are a lot of people today in the body of Christ who are actually looking very much to other people, especially if they are living in, a, in, a, in an area where, you know, there are a lot of Christians and they to smell the smell of meat. They begin to smell the meat of, you know, some mutton is cooking or some chicken is cooking and it is a Friday or it is a particular day that they don't fast and it is the season of Lent. Immediately, they are developing a judgment in their mind. They begin to start judging those people. Look at those people. They know it is Friday. They know it is Wednesday. They know that it is a day of fasting. We should avoid meat. And look at all the smell. And they are also getting all, you know, flustered because of all the smells that they are hearing. I want to ask you, my dear sisters and brothers, listen to this very carefully. The Spirit of God is talking to each one of us right now. This question that John the Baptist's disciples were asking Jesus, saying, the Pharisees are fasting, we are fasting, but your disciples are not fasting. Is there a difference between the question of John's disciples and those who are asking these questions today? Those who are judging others today. You know, my brothers and sisters, there is absolutely no difference in that. There is absolutely no difference. The moment you are beginning to question somebody, the moment you are beginning to judge somebody because they are not following the what you are doing, you have got a particular religion to follow. If you want to fast 365 days, no problem. You want to eat meat 365 days, no problem. You want to eat meat on a Friday and a Saturday or a Wednesday, no problem. You know, my sister and brothers, let me put you in context with the New, New Testament. You know the reason why such people ask these questions? Do you know why? It's because they do not know the truth, including many church leaders and people in authority. They don't know the truth. They don't, they even don't know what the word is telling us today. They don't even know which covenant we are in today because we are simply following traditions. We have taken this scripture out of context and we are telling people that they must fast. You know, my brothers and sisters, sometimes we are even today in the body of Christ, people are following tradition. Some people are following the law. They are not able to differentiate between the old covenant and the new covenant. You know, sisters and brothers, again, before I go and explain this, you know what Jesus said in, 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 in Luke chapter in Luke chapter 6, I believe. Luke chapter 6, verses 38 or 39, somewhere. Let me go there, Luke chapter 6, somewhere between 38 to 40. You know, he said, can one blind man lead the other? 
can one blind man lead the other? They will not, will they not? Let's read that. Verse number 39. Let's read that. And he spoke a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? You know what is Jesus saying, my sister and brother? He's talking about the leaders. He's talking about those people who are supposed to lead. He's saying, can the blind lead the blind? Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into a ditch? You know, sister and brothers, the question is very having a very obvious answer. It's either yes or no. A one blind man cannot lead another blind man. A one person who can see can lead another person. One person who can see can lead a blind man. But two, one blind man can never lead another blind man. So my sister and brothers, let's come to the real issue. What is the purpose of fasting? That is the main question. You know, when, when the disciples of John the Baptist, they said that we are fasting, they said the Pharisees are fasting, and then they are questioning Jesus, why you are not fasting? Immediately, Jesus has got an answer, which we'll see in the next verse. But I want you to understand that this question is even put by people in the body of Christ today. There is no difference between the disciples of John the Baptist and some of us who are asking this question, why people are not fasting. So what is the purpose of fasting? You know, I'm sitting brother, first and foremost, fasting is not for the purpose of manipulating God. You're not, we cannot manipulate God by our fasting. You know, you know what, what should I say is, you know, God, God can never be manipulated. You cannot try to, you know, twist the arms of God. You know, it's commonly thought that, you know, to deny self, for the purpose of making our soul or our mind less dominant by the knowledge we receive every day. You know, please understand this. Because we live in this world today, we can see with our eyes, we can hear with our ears, we can smell with our nose, we can feel all those things that are happening around. And you know, my brothers and sisters, the real purpose of fasting is to make this mind of us, to make our soul, not the, not the spirit, but our soul, because we can think, we can see everything that we are thinking, everything that we perceive is based on our five senses. So our mind, our mind, or that is our soul is connected with our five senses. It is what controls our five senses. So in order that our mind or our, our soul is not controlled by our five senses because of all the information that we receive from this world, but to make us more sensitive in our spirit, Fasting becomes a very important tool. Fasting becomes a very important tool. And you know, my brothers and sisters, I'm going to share this a little bit more so that you will understand. Fasting is not to manipulate God. Fasting is not to get anything from God. Fasting is, is, is not going to make God angry even if you eat 365 days. God is not going to be upset whether you fast or don't fast. There is nothing to do with God as far as fasting is concerned. But there is a time to fast and there is a time not to fast. What is the meaning of this? Many times somebody will say, what is the time to fast? Maybe the season of length is, is the season to fast. Maybe, you know, it's a particular day of the week to fast. Why do you fast? No, I just want to fast. You know, my sister and brothers, these disciples of Jesus were in the presence of Almighty God. They were praying. The presence of Almighty God was manifested in the flesh. Jesus was Almighty God but he was walking in front of them in the flesh. So if they were in the presence of God, they did not need to fast. It was a time for them to rejoice. It was a time for them to celebrate. It was a time for them to have a great time. It was a time for them to be joyful, but it was not a time for them to fast. And you know, my brothers and sisters, Jesus did not lead his disciples one day even, even one day to fast, while he was with them on this earth. You know, you know, you know, my brothers and sisters, let me, let me, let me put it to you this way. Ever since Jesus started his ministry, till the day he went to the cross, you never heard a single day when Jesus said, you know what, my disciples, come, let's all have a closed door session. Let us all fast and pray. Let's do a three-day fast. And, you know, let us, let us ask the father to, you know, do something special in our life. You know, we need to fast. We need to pray. There are so much of trouble around us. These Pharisees are coming against us. You know, there is, I can sense in the spiritual realm, there is so much of disturbance taking place. So let's all fast and let us all pray so that we can, you know, get the Father to, to, to give us some grace or some strength. You will never read anywhere in the scriptures 
where Jesus, from the time he started his ministry till the time he actually, you know, died on the cross, that he ever fasted. He fasted before he started his ministry. He, he, he received the baptism. He went into the, into the wilderness and he fasted there for 40 days. And the word of God says, after he fasted for 40 days, he was put to the test. The devil came to tempt him. But Jesus was so strong in his spirit. He had become so, you know, he had, he had, he, his, his mind had become so captivated by the word of God. He was so much spiritually connected to God that he was, his soul or his mind was not being connected. So the moment the devil came with those thoughts, Jesus was so much connected in the spirit to his father that he opened his mouth and every time he checkmated the devil by saying, it is written. It is written. The first time with him, when he was hungry, the devil came to him and he says, you know, if you're really the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Now, brothers and sisters, there's nothing wrong to turn stones into bread if you're hungry for 40 days. There's absolutely nothing wrong. Jesus had the power. But the problem was, the devil told him, if you are the son of God. Now, the problem is, Jesus had no doubt in his mind that he was the son of God. He had heard it at, the, at, at his baptism. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But the temptation that the devil gave him is, if you turn stones into bread, it will be a confirmation that you are the son of God. So, brothers and sisters, Jesus, after he finished the 40 days of fasting and he was filled with the power, not only with the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit and power, he started his ministry and he never, ever fasted, even right up to the cross of Calvary. So, brothers and sisters, we must remember one thing. You know, the disciples were in the awesome presence of God. They were in the awesome presence of God. They were in the awesome presence of God. And you know, my brothers and sisters, because they were in the awesome presence of God, they did not need to fast. They did not have to do anything of this sort. Because after he rose from the dead and he ascended back to the Father, then only his disciples began to fast. He said that, you know, he said there is a time coming when the, uh, the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. But again, my sisters and brothers, the disciples did not fast because the bridegroom was taken away from them, as is wrongly taught in the body of Christ. Today. You know, if you if you read, if you read, you know, in verse number 15, again, I'm going ahead of myself. It says, can the children of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them and then they shall pass. So brothers and sisters, if you connect both these verses together, it tells us, According to this verse, that after Jesus died and then he went back to the Father, the disciples would need to fast. And that's what they did. They fasted. But again, my sister and brothers, I want to share with you something very important, which has been wrongly taught today. Just because Jesus went back to the Father, the bridegroom was taken away from them. It doesn't mean that now we have to fast. Jesus had already given his disciples, you know, several assurances why he was with them that he would never leave them, nor he would ever forsake them. So if he said in verse number 15, that, you know, one day the bridegroom shall be taken away from them and then they will pass. Many people have taken this scripture literally like this and said, now that Jesus is not with the disciples, that's why they are fasting because he told them that once he's taken away from them, once he ascends to the father, they must fast. But again, my sister and brothers, Jesus also told them that he would never leave them. He would never forsake them. He would be with them, in them, till the end of time. So let me show you some scriptures that even though Jesus said the bridegroom shall be taken away from them and then they will fast, look at some of these scriptures which point out that Jesus also said he would never leave them or forsake them. Let us look at the first one, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, you know, my brothers and sisters, in verse number 20, you read, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. 
and he says, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Unto the end of the world. He thought that the only way, my sister and brothers, that he was going to, even though he was going to go away from them, he would never leave them. He would never forsake them. I want to show you another scripture, which also points out why he said that he would never leave them, never forsake them. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number five. Let's read that. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number five is another scripture which also, you know, gives us the assurance from Jesus that he would never leave us or forsake us. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So my brothers and sisters, my question to you is, if Jesus said, go back to Matthew chapter 9, because again in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus, what did he say? He said that a time is coming when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them and then they shall fast. But again, you're listening to so many scriptures where he's saying, I will never leave you, never forsake you. That means, my sister and brothers, if Jesus said that he would never leave them and never forsake them, then why is he saying that when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them and they shall fast? You know, if you, if you really see what he said in these verses that we just saw in Matthew chapter 28, in Hebrew chapter 13, verse 5, you know, on the day of Pentecost, you know, my sister and brothers, the Holy Spirit came to reside over in, in, in every believer of the Lord Jesus Christ permanently, permanently. And today, in those who are born again, the Holy Spirit has made a permanent dwelling. You know, you know, my sister and brothers, please understand this. If Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, before he ascended to the Father, that he would never leave them, never forsake them. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrew chapter 13, verse number 5, that, you know, he will never leave us, never forsake us. Then again, you know, if he said this, then when did it really take place, even though Jesus went back to the Father? It happened on the day of Pentecost. So let's go and look at Acts chapter 2 and see from verses 1 to 4 what exactly happened on the day of Pentecost. You know, my sister and brothers, I want you to understand something. Really, if you get this, this truth in your, in your spirit, you will simply not be doing external rituals without understanding what you really do. Because people today in the body of Christ, if you tell them to do something, you tell them to pray, you tell them to do something, they simply blindly follow. But you must remember, when you have the spirit of God with you, whatever you do, you need to do it for a particular reason. You need to understand what you're doing. Don't just be blind people. Don't just do something because you are told to do. Let the spirit of God guide you to do a particular thing. Let's read this. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want you to look at verse number four. It says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. You know, my sister and brothers, on the day of Pentecost, those disciples, 120 of them, along with Mary, who were in the upper room, when Jesus told them, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the power to come from on high. On that day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit did not come only on the outside and go away as he did in the Old Testament, but he came to stay permanently upon everyone who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, my sister and brothers, I want you to understand this. You know, when Jesus said, I will never leave you, never forsake you. He said, I am low, I am with you until the end of time. Jesus never gave them false promises. Jesus never told them that although he was physically going to go away from them, he was never going to be seen by them. He told them 
he would be sending them the helper. He told them that he would send the Holy Spirit. He told them he would send the comforter. He told them he would send them the advocate. And on the, uh, in, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse number 4, it tells us they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to take you again further to what St. Paul writes to the Romans. You know, if, you, if, 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 if he's writing to the Romans, he's writing this for, to each one of us. Please understand, without the Holy Spirit, it is impossible for us to live a Christian life. Without the Holy Spirit, without the presence of God living on the inside of us, it is impossible, not just difficult, it is impossible for us to live a Christian life. You know, my brothers and sisters, if this particular truth is not getting inside of us, we will simply be doing religion. We will simply be going about our life without any power and we will never be able to fulfill our God-given assignment on this earth. Let me take you to what St. Paul says to the Romans in Romans chapter 8, verse number 9. Romans chapter 8, verse number 9. Let's read this verse because this verse is going to open up a lot of things to our understanding right now. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now, you know, my sister and brothers, if you look at verse number nine, I, you know, there are, there, are, there are a few things that we need to understand because there is something called as spirit of God. There is spirit of Christ. Look at, look, just highlight those things. First and foremost, I want you to see this. It says, but you are not in the flesh. But in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now, the spirit of God and the spirit of Christ are two different entities. Two different entities. And to understand this, my brothers and sisters, I want to share with you something very beautiful. Listen to this very carefully. Let us go and see what Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse number 17. John chapter 14, verse number 17. This is what Jesus is talking about, the spirit of truth. So that what Jesus explains in John chapter 14, verse number 17, will give us a better understanding of Romans chapter 8, verse number 9. So let's go and read this verse. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. What is Jesus saying in verse number 17? He's saying, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. You know, the spirit of truth, the world cannot receive. Why the world cannot receive? Because it sees him not, neither they know him. But you know him because he dwells in you and shall be in you. Now, you know, my sister, brother, like, please, please pay attention here. If you multitask or you get distracted, this truth will not help you. I want you to pay attention very carefully. In John chapter 14, verse number 17, that is on your screen right now, Jesus is saying that the spirit of truth cannot be received by any Tom, Dick and Harry. It cannot be received by any, anybody on the streets. It cannot be received by anyone by doing religion. It cannot be received by people by just going to church. It cannot be received by just people doing religion. It can only be received when you are born again. You know, if you look at this verse again, no one can receive the Holy Spirit until they have first received Jesus as their Lord, their God, and their Savior. So please understand the, 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 the process before a person receives the spirit of God, the spirit of truth, they must receive the spirit of Christ, which means those who have been, who have received the spirit of God dwelling in them are now born again. And they are not, you know, just, you know, people who are going about life, you know, so coming back, let's come back to Roman chapter eight, verse nine. In this verse, we are realizing that you cannot receive the spirit of truth. You cannot receive the Holy Spirit until you have received Christ, until you are born again. Now, coming back to Romans chapter 8, verse number 9, what does it say? But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. This is the Holy Spirit. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, that is, if you are not born again, 
you cannot belong to him. So what is Romans chapter 8 verse number 9 saying? We see that in this passage, my brother, you look at the entire Roman chapter 8, it makes a statement that every believer receives the spirit of Christ at salvation. So Roman chapter 8 verse 9, when it talks about the spirit of Christ, can you highlight that? Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ. So remember, the day you accept Jesus as your Lord, God, and Savior, the day you accepted him as, as, your, as your God, you were born again, your spirit became brand new. And that day, you received the spirit of Christ. The spirit of Christ is what we have received on the day of our salvation. The day we, we confessed him as our Lord, we confessed him as our Lord, God, and Savior. You know, the gospel was preached to us. We realized that when the gospel was preached, we saw that Jesus dying on the cross. He never died in front of us, but the way it was preached, we, 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 are, we are made to believe that he died right in front of us. We confessed him as our Lord and we received the spirit of Christ. So that happens on the day of our salvation. And again, my brothers and sisters, it doesn't end at that just because you have received the spirit of Christ. You know, many have assumed and, you know, made some, you know, I would say wrong suppositions that the spirit of Christ and the spirit of God are the same thing. They are not the same thing. The spirit of Christ and the spirit of God are not the same thing. Although some people have made to believe and every Christian receives the Holy Spirit at salvation. That is not true. Not everybody received the spirit of, 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 of the truth at the time of salvation. These are two different things. The first thing you must do is receive the spirit of Christ, which is at, at the time when you are born again. Then, of course, you need to receive the, the spirit of truth. So the spirit of Christ is one that refers to us when we were born again. But every spirit, every born again believer who has got the spirit of Christ must also receive the spirit of God, which is referring to the Holy Spirit that comes to dwell inside this believer when they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So remember, my sister and brothers, there are two things here. One is the spirit of Christ, which is when you receive the new birth, when you were born again. And the second one is the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit, which you receive through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So many people today, because they have no knowledge, they have made a total hodgepodge out of it. They simply think that the spirit of God comes inside of them. It is not so. The spirit of Christ is the spirit when we were born again. The spirit of Christ is the day when we accepted him as our Lord, God and Savior. That was the day the gospel was preached to us. I began to understand what happened on the cross of Calvary. And I accepted Jesus as my, as my Lord, God and Savior. My spirit and the spirit of Christ became one. And now I receive the spirit of Christ. But it doesn't end there. I still need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And at that time, I now receive the Holy Spirit. That's what we saw in Acts chapter 2, verse number 4. So let me go back to Acts chapter 2, verse number 4, and go back to the day of Pentecost and show you what happened. Remember, these disciples, when Jesus was already raised from the dead, they had already received the Spirit of Christ. They were already born again. They accepted him as their Lord, God, and Savior. So they were born again, but they were told not to go out because they had not been baptized by the Holy Spirit. They had still not received the Holy Spirit of the day of Pentecost. So on the day of Pentecost, that is in Acts chapter 2, verse number 4, they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You know, my brothers and sisters, this is teaching us that, that you know, what was given earlier or, or, you know, on the day, on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you can refer to it, you know, what, what, what I've been sharing with you. You know, I had given a topic about five or six or seven months ago about this particular topic, about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, about the baptism of Christ, how we receive the Spirit of Christ, how we receive the Spirit of truth. And therefore, if you really need to know about this more, you can go back to this teaching. So the whole point, my sisters and brothers, is that now that we have the Holy Spirit, now that we have Almighty God living on the inside of us, we are no more alone. We are no more left orphan. We are not, you know, left without, without God living on the inside of us. However, now listen to this. I am going to talk to you this with respect to fasting. So now Jesus said, one day the bridegroom shall be taken away from them and then they will fast. Now again, the scriptures that we saw also going to point to tell us that we have the spirit of Christ. We have the Holy Ghost with us. 
God lives on the inside of us. Therefore, he has never left us alone. He has never left us often. Then how come Jesus says, you know, when, when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them and they will fast. I hope you're really understanding this whole thing. First and foremost, he's saying, a time will come when I'll be taken away from them and they will fast. Now these scriptures that I just explained to you also tell us he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. The spirit of Christ will be within us. The spirit of truth will be within us through, our, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, what is the, how do we reconcile these two things together? You know, my brothers and sisters, since we live in a fallen world, we are living in a fallen world. There are times when, you know, we are faced with issues. We are faced with situations that crop up that make that problem look so huge. And then, you know, that, that help that, you know, make us change our focus from God onto our circumstances, onto our problem. Now what happens? Is it, is, has God left us because of our situation? Has God left us because of our circumstances? No, he is with us in us till the end of time. We only need to remember that. We need to, you know, we need to renew our mind on this. So how do we do that? Fasting helps us. Fasting and prayer helps us to refocus from our problem to God's word and obtain victory over our situation. I hope you really understood this truth. Remember, when Jesus said, a time is coming when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them and then they will pass. So people say, oh, Jesus has already gone to the Father, so we must pass now. That's not true. If you have the Holy Spirit in you and you know you are you're really operating by faith, you have, you have grown in your faith, that you know you don't you are not focused by your senses, you're not focused by your report, you're not focused by your situation, but you are so focused on the word of God, then why are you fasting? What are you fasting for? Just fasting because it's a passion, just because everybody is fasting? No, you don't fast for that reason. You fast only when your situation becomes so big, your, your problem is so huge that it finds it difficult for you to focus on the word of God, to focus on this Christ who's on the inside of you. Fasting and prayer changes your focus from your external situation to this God who's on the inside of you to refocus on the word of God so that now you can get the victory by keeping your faith, by holding on to the word, and receiving the victory. This is exactly, my brothers and sisters, what Jesus was saying in verse number 15. So let's go to verse number 15. I want to show you why he said, or what he said that reason. Let's go to verse number 15. And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them. And then shall they fast. Who is the bridegroom, my brothers and sisters? The church is the bride of Jesus. And Jesus is the bridegroom. And he was taken away from the disciples on the day of ascension. You, you, we all know that, you know, when we read uh, Matthew chapter 28, we just read these verses 18 to 20. He gathered all his disciples at Bethany and then he was raised up and he went out of their sight. That was the day he went and he never appeared again. He's now gone and seated at the right hand of the father. But he promised us that he would leave the, he not never leave us and forsake us because he would send the Holy Spirit. So my brothers and sisters, as long as Jesus was with his disciples, they could get him to do, you know, the things that, you know, they wanted that had to be done. For example, if they required some food, they wanted to feed the people, or they or somebody was not well, Peter's mother-in-law was not well, or somebody had to be raised from the dead, or some miracle had to be done. Jesus was with them. He would pray, he would use his faith, and all the problem would be solved. Now, my brothers and sisters, that Jesus had gone back to the Father, now the disciples had to operate based on the teachings, based on the words that Jesus had taught them. Now Jesus is not physically with them. Now he has only given them the teaching. Now he has only given them the truth. Now the Holy Spirit in them is the one who is reminding them. Now my brothers and sisters, in order for them to focus on the word and not on their problem, they had to fast and pray. And this fasting and praying helped the disciples to get back to faith and win every single time. Win every single time. And you know, my sister and brothers, if you really understand this, you know, many of us in the body of Christ, they simply not just fast. Because, it's, you know, some people are fasting today because they want to lose weight. 
maybe they have put on some extra kilos they need to fast because they've got a probably a big paunch or probably you know the 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 scale is showing much more weight so they want to skip a breakfast or skip a lunch that is not going to help you that's only for your physical to look good or to you know to be admired by people but if you're going to fast for a reason you're fasting because you have a situation you have a circumstance you have a problem you have an issue you got a report and you find it so hard to stay on the word of god so when you fast and you pray you are able to now refocus train your mind your mind now instead of looking at the circumstances by fasting and praying it's a spiritual exercise to refocus on the word of god and now obtain victory and that is what you and i as believers are called to do you know my sister and brothers today i hope you understood what fasting really is about fasting is not a fashion fasting is not somebody some person with their collar turned backwards tells us to fast and we simply do the fasting but fasting can be done any time of the year fasting can be done over a period of time there is no particular fixed season for fasting fasting is to be determined based on your circumstance and situation so that it will train your mind not to be governed not to be dominated by your senses not to be dominated by the by the situation that is come against you but you can refocus on the word of god and receive victory by the word of god that is your faith amen i hope my sister and brother this is absolutely clear that you will begin to do the fasting with this in mind so that every time you fast and pray maybe you know you need to fast and pray depending on what situation you have sometimes you know because our situation has remained for so long it's been remained for months some of us have gone through that situation for years it becomes extremely difficult for us in order to focus and on the word of god and come out of that situation but if you really begin to start fasting you begin to take the scriptures you will find initially you will go through a lot of difficulty you may even be tormented you will know your your senses will make you angry it will make you eat the food and it will make you a lot of you know a lot of negative emotions will come through but if you hold on and you train your mind with fasting and prayer that too by with by using the word of god as you begin to do this exercise you will eventually start training your mind to begin to believe with what is in your born again spirit and you will see the glory every single time of your life amen let us pray sister bernadin let us pray yes sir thank you jesus praise you lord thank you father thank you abba father for this wonderful time lord lord as we look to you only lord god lord father i pray that you will <clears throat> bless us lord each and every day of our lives lord as we listen to the word of god listen to brother vincent's talk his teaching lord that you will plant in us lord that you will put in us lord so that we can grow in you lord each and every day of our lives as as we go on in our daily lives lord that you strengthen us lord that you are with us lord as you said lord you are with us that you will never forsake us lord and you will never leave us lord lord i pray that <clears throat> even if we lack of you lord god but you are there with us lord no matter what lord jesus lord i pray that each one of us lord as as we hear brother vincent's talk lord the team lord lord i pray that you bless us lord in this group lord every day lord and you bless us abundantly lord and you are with us lord in jesus name amen amen father i thank you for this teaching that you gave us on fasting i pray father that we will today understand the spiritual significance of fasting that fasting will not just be an exercise for us just because we have to do it just because we have to follow it just because we have to do some ritual but we will do fasting and pray with the understanding that every negative situation of our life we will be over, able to overcome through fasting 
and keeping our focus on your word by training our mind not to be ruled by our senses, but by the truth of your word. And for this teaching, Lord, and this understanding, we thank you and praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you.